agenda. We're going to try to get started, and I know people are going to come late, and that's okay. Um, my name is Karen Miller. I'm a professor here at LaGuardia Community College. Um, and this teaching came about because um, one of my colleagues, Laura, is somewhere, um, emailed a group of us saying, oh my god, H2Q, um, Amazon has chosen Long Island City um, for its second headquarters, what are we going to do? And I said, why don't we try to have a teach-in? Um, the the, the teach-in concept um, comes from the Vietnam War when students were interested in educating themselves on what was going on in Southeast Asia and how to become active in that struggle. And we thought we would adopt that language here on a college campus so that we can educate ourselves about what's going on um, with Amazon's H2Q and think together a little bit about how to get involved in a struggle regarding what's happening um, in Long Island City um, generally. So um, thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited to have you here. Is anybody here um, from, a com from the community who was not brought here by their class? I'm just curious. Okay, a few people. Great. Oh, yay, that's so great. Um, so, um, so we're going to get started. Um, because we have a very full um, agenda, we're asking folks to talk for just a few minutes, um, eight to ten minutes, and then um, we're going to open the floor for questions. Um, so, Philip, take it away. Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Professor Miller, for organizing this. Um, thank you to the panelists for, for coming. Um, and thank you all for, for, for attending as well. Um, we think this is a very um, important topic, very relevant to all of us as, as students, residents, workers, etc. cetera. So um, I'm going <coughs> to moderate the first panel. But before I do that, um, before, I, before I introduce the speakers, um, I'd like to take a few minutes um, just to talk about Amazon um, as a company more generally. Um, so most of you uh, probably know Amazon as a digital marketplace. Uh, for purchasing goods online from books, shoes, uh, consumer electronics, um, um, and many other items. Um, but of course, Amazon is much more than that. Um, so here are some of the facts and, and, and figures I, th I think it uh, might be useful to consider when thinking about um, really the scope of Amazon. Um, so Amazon has a market value of over $1 trillion. Its founder and CEO, Jeff Bezos, um, is the world's richest man, as you probably know, worth an estimated $166 billion. It sells more books, toys, apparel, and consumer electronics than any other retailer online or off. 55% of all online shopping searches begin directly on Amazon, bypassing Google altogether. It captures one out of every two dollars spent online in America. Half of all American households subscribe to Amazon Prime. Through, its, uh, through Amazon Web Services, uh, it controls uh, a full third of the world's public <coughs> uh, cloud computing capacity, including that of Netflix, uh, the Dow Jones, the Pentagon, and the CIA. This is more than Microsoft, IBM, and Google combined. It owns Zappos, Shopbop, <coughs> IMDb, Twitch, which is the largest video game live streaming site, Audible, which is a top seller of audiobooks, Goodreads, Diapers.com, Whole Foods, and the Washington Post, among others. It sells ads online, processes payments for other e-commerce businesses, uh, makes small loans, and produces original content for television and movies. It manufactures thousands of products, including batteries and diapers, through its Amazon Basics brand, and has its own fashion lines, I think seven of them, uh, and publishing house. It currently employs more than a thousand people working on artificial intelligence and robotics. Amazon's physical footprint is also vast. It currently owns or leases approximately 250 million square feet. This is not even counting the two new headquarters uh, that are anticipated. It currently operates 75 fulfillment centers and 25 sortation centers across North America, including several in New Jersey, uh, one in Staten Island, and one soon to come uh, in Woodside, Queens. It has opened hundreds of brick and mortar stores across the country, including bookstores, <coughs> convenience stores, and showrooms for its devices. It has warehouses within 20 miles of half of the US population. 
It has its own branded cargo planes, its own fleet of des delivery drivers, and has obtained an ocean shipping license that will allow it to move freight directly from China to U.S. ports. It's begun constructing its own wind and solar facilities. Uh, and finally, among the top 10 U.S. industries by GDP, Amazon is in some way involved in all but one, uh, the exception being real estate uh, for now. So uh, it's an exhaustive list. Um, but how did Amazon get so big? How has it managed to extend its tentacles into so many sectors and industries? Uh, to answer this question, I think it's helpful to think about what kind of company Amazon is. Fundamentally, Amazon is a digital platform, like Google, Facebook, and to some extent, Apple. It, that provides uh, a basic infrastructure for two or more groups to connect and interact online. This includes customers, producers, advertisers, service providers, and suppliers. As an intermediary between different groups, Amazon benefits enormously from what economists call network effects, in which the value of the platform to a particular user increases with every additional user. So in the case of Amazon, the more merchants there are selling on Amazon, the better shoppers can be assured that they are searching all possible vendors. And the more shoppers there are, the more vendors feel that they have to be on Amazon, leading to a virtuous cycle of growth. But Amazon, of course, is not just an impartial intermediary. Crucially, it's also a competitor to the retailers and manufacturers who have come to depend upon the platform to reach their customers and conduct their business. Because Amazon is also in a privileged position to extract all kinds of data from its users, including what we search for, find, don't find, browse, buy, and don't buy, it can very easily enter into competition with the vendors on its website or even with manufacturers by producing its own products, which it has done in product line after product line, service after service. Data has become the lifeblood of the digital economy, and Amazon has built a vast apparatus for extracting data and extremely powerful tools for analyzing them. With its vast financial resources, moreover, Amazon has also been able to sell many products and services below cost, thus eliminating competition through what is known as predatory pricing. This is how Amazon entered the bookselling business and how it continues to expand into new sectors. So Kindle, Echo, which is powered by Alexa, and Prime are more recent examples of this approach. Though Amazon loses an estimated $1 billion a year on the shipping costs of Prime, more importantly, this service provides an extremely effective way to lock customers into the Amazon ecosystem. Customers who join Prime are much more likely to order exclusively through Amazon, not just because of the speed of delivery, but also in order to take full advantage of the fixed yearly membership fee. Consumers who have not joined Prime, on the other hand, are often penalized by Amazon through delayed shipping or even canceled orders. Retailers have also been held hostage to Amazon's fees, which, Im which it imposes at will, as well as the increased shipping costs they face as a result of the bargain Amazon has struck with UPS and FedEx as the biggest customers for these services. The upshot of this, retailers have flocked to Amazon's own cheaper warehousing and shipping service, known as fulfillment by Amazon, which is now challenging the dominance of UPS and FedEx. Amazon wins again. So Amazon's business model has never really been about maximizing profits, not yet, at least. In fact, it failed to generate profits for several years and still hemorrhages money on various services and products. <laughs> Rather, for Amazon, it's always been about conquering market share and playing the so-called long game. And investors have been happy to finance this expansion. So where is Amazon ultimately headed? Well, it's impossible to know, of course, but I think we can certainly point to some worrisome trends. With its dominant position in digital commerce, Amazon is not just expanding within the market, it is increasingly becoming the market. But this, of course, is not an open and public market governed by uniform rules and regulations. Rather, it's a kind of privatized or enclosed market whose participants are organized, supervised, and policed by Amazon itself. Accepting these terms and their associated risks has simply become an additional cost of doing business online. Businesses and consumers must pay rent to engage in digital commerce, 
and Amazon is the landlord. Okay, so um, I'd like now to introduce our first speaker for this panel, Professor Stephen Lang. Um, he'll be talking about uh, Long Island City and um, the sort of ongoing transformations in the neighborhood dating back to, I guess, the early 1990s. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Lang. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, uh, thanks, Philip. So I'm gonna just start, I'm gonna just talk about Long Island City, specifically what's been going on, some of the plans that have been happening here, especially under Bloomberg and, uh, and our current mayor, the mayor of the tale of two cities. And uh, some of the things that have been happening and, and are folding as we speak, basically. And I'm gonna look at the waterfront. which is where Amazon is going to go. By the way, there's been several plans uh, coming out recently. Here's one over the summer. And it kind of envisioned uh, Long Island City, it's kind of the area where the Amazon headquarters is going to go, as a kind of new tech center, right? They're increasingly trying to promote this area and develop it as a kind of tech center, something like a kind of silicone, urban Silicon Valley, right? I wish I had more time to look at this map. It's quite interesting, but we have to, we don't have a lot of time. There's the area. Um, here's a nice map that talks about some of the things we're gonna be talking about. Uh, uh, okay, sorry about that. Uh, specifically, we're gonna talk about Hunters Point South. And by the way, when I talk about the waterfront, it's not just the East River. Long Island City has another large waterfront, Newtown Creek. And it's uh, pretty important because it's a, a manufacturing zone area. And actually, I think one of Cuomo's things, he was going to rename it the Amazon River. And I thought that was insane, but uh, I didn't even know they were coming. I thought that was like some kind of joke. And so who knows what? what the future holds. Uh, one of the big things going on right now, uh, it, it, it's in the midst of a feasibility planning study, is this huge uh, Sunnyside Yards right out the, you know, up, I'm sure a lot of you came over it today. And that's an amazing uh, mega project in the works, possibly much larger than the Hudson Yards, which, is, which has actually happened. Uh, I'm just going to go back to some of the early waterfront plans. In 2003, uh, one of the things happening in Long Island City was New York was trying to get the Olympics here. And, 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 and one part of the plan that was, uh, was being worked on was to create an Olympic village on Hunters Point South. And they had a competition. Many, many people came. Here's some of the images. Uh, Never happened, of course, uh, but still the idea was that when, when the Olympics were over, this village would become residential and it would be a catalyst. And it was also a, part of that plan was this catalyst to see the city, to you know, de-Manhattanize the city and kind of like the Olympic venues that would be all over in different areas and you'd use the waterfront to get there via ferry. Uh, just skipping ahead to 2007, now Bloomberg comes out with a sustainability plan and it's basically a blueprint for gentrification, but it stresses it building it on waterfront, you know, brownfields, high density development, and it's, it's almost like a, it is seen as a climate mitigation strategy. Uh, here's an image. But, if, you know, by the way, this is in the, uh, one of the images that was in plan NYC 2007, and that's Hunters Point South. Um, it's changed, there it is now. Um, one of the things that happened was, was Hurricane Sandy, right? And when, when Hurricane Sandy happened, a lot of people said, wow, I can, are we gonna keep building intensely on the development? And Bloomberg gave a famous speech, and it was right on Hunter's Point South, and he says, we will not retreat from the waterfront, we will build bigger, better, stronger, and of course, more, this buzzword, resiliently. And so now, uh, there's waterfront development everywhere, actually all over the country. 
And even in the midst of climate change worries, people are just building, except it's now they're building <coughs> resiliently. Uh, another aspect of the waterfront that's really important is right next to where the Amazon headquarters is going to go is Queensbridge Housing, the largest NYCHA development project in the nation. And, and, one of the, when, and I'm just going to quote when, when de Blasio was, gave a press conference, he, he talked about the synergy between Queensbridge and Amazon, how they'll work together. Um, the synergy is going to be extraordinary. I mean, that was a quote from him. But at the same time that they're talking about this, there's a major crisis in NYCHA. NYCHA is, is in the midst of a major catastrophe. It's, oh, there's $32 billion, it's $32 billion in debt. A lot of times you'll see it's in the paper every day talking about heat and hot water. The major issue is it's maybe will be dismantled. And so one of the plans going on right now is to kind of build in the infill, some luxury developments, and privatize a lot of NYCHA. So again, the, the thing is when these waterfront developments, you have the Bloomberg plan to build high rise on the waterfront, and it's also one of Bloomberg couch it as an affordability thing. How so? It's this neoliberal kind of urban development. You let the developers build, you build tall, and they set aside some that's affordable. So it's, that's really important because a lot of people are saying, how can Amazon come in, into a city that's gentrifying rapidly? And they say, don't worry, we have an amazing affordability plan. But it's an affordability plan based on, it's a kind of gentrification to solve gentrification. Just keep building, keep building, and use the government to set aside some af affordable apartments. Uh, I'm just going to go on. Okay, another major development, 2000, and, you know, with the financial crisis, 2007, 2008. Bloomberg was really, he wanted to shift New York away from reliance on Wall Street. And it caught, that's when he kind of came up with a thing for Cornell Tech. And it's, I'm just going to quote something. Our goal has been to make New York City the global capital of technological innovation. And this new campus in Roosevelt Island is a central part of that strategy. And here's, I'm just going to, this is an image of this thing. Uh, as part of our five borough economic opportunity plan, to dis we're going to try to diversify our economic base. So that in the future, when Wall Street sneezes, the rest of the city doesn't catch a cold. And I think that's a, that's a big part of what Bloomberg was trying to do, to diversify the economy. And I think if you look at Long Island City, you see the result of that, right? This is emerging as a kind of new tech center, <laughs> a mixed use. By the way, there's the, plaque, so there's the plan where Cornell, where uh, Amazon will go. That was a previous plan, now going to be replaced by Amazon. And I just want to shift around to the, the, the waterfront area behind LaGuardia here, actually, along Newtown Creek. What's emerging is a kind of industrial, a new kind of industrial development. It's, it's being dubbed the factory district. And it's kind of like these high tech, you know, a lot of uh, adaptive reusing the old factory buildings into these new kind of spaces that are, uh, you know, like, like for example, behind LaGuardia, there's the Fauci building, and you have uh, Uber is there, Lyft is there, there's a lot of kind of small startup companies, and I think the whole area is being, is being, fra is being touted as this new kind of emerging, kind of mixed use in new type of industry. So that's where we are, and by the way, these are some of the images, two minutes, okay. These are not your typical factories, right? The new working for waterfront, here's the abundant amenities, community, what do you see? A lot of people in front of computer screens. Uh, here, these are some of the things just happening right now, being developed. So where does this leave us? Amazon's c coming here. Everybody's worrying about what impact will it have? Will it intensify the gentrification that's been taking place? Our leaders are saying it's not, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. We have plans in place. We're building, <coughs> we're building affordable housing. We have plenty of housing. And, uh, and yet 
look what's happening. I mean, I think we're gonna, I'm going to leave that up to the other speakers to talk about, but it's just something to think about. Uh, are we, can, it, can it absorb this, as they say? And I just want to read one thing more. Uh, one person that I think that we should be looking at is Richard Florida, who was always talking about how, we, how cities have to compete for the tech people, the creative class, and they have to rebrand themselves and kind of, you know, create all these kind of new luxury spaces. Uh, but, you know, there's a dark side. And Florida quotes someone who said, high tech districts are manufacturers of inequality, but that's the price of progress. So I think that's where we're at today. P people are going headstrong into this movement to create tech center. Maybe New York is going to be the next Silicon Valley. But what, what is, the, what's, is it the cost of progress? Is, what is the cost of progress? Just something to think about. And I just sort of laid out some of the background for Long Island City here and, to see, and see where we go from here. All right, thank you, Professor Lang. Um, so our next speaker is Celia Weaver, uh, who is the Research and Policy Director at New York Communities for Change. Uh, please join me in welcoming Celia Weaver. Hi. Um, I don't have a presentation. Um, but I am going to talk a little bit <clears throat> about Amazon, what the city is giving to Amazon, just for a quick review there, and then um, the housing crisis in New York City, which is really self-evident, um, but just to sort of underscore a little bit about the sort of, what are the political choices that we're making in order to uh, prioritize Amazon coming to New York City instead of some other things that we could do. Um, so we are giving Amazon about Three billion dollars in a variety of tax or tax tax credits, um, tax benefits, and land use and things like that over the next um, 12 years. Um, in, in addition to that, three billion dollars in sort of financial incentives, um, some of which are even like just direct cash subsidies to Amazon. We're also um, giving them priority to build on this on this piece of land that was slated for 1500 units of affordable housing um, so that's 1500 units that are not going to be built um, we've also invested in some infrastructure upgrades in long island city and things like uh, like a ferry system um, that are really meant to benefit amazon employees and not necessarily people who have been living in queens for forever um, so like the previous speaker said um, the, in this neighborhood, we have the nation's largest public housing project, um, Queensbridge Houses. Queensbridge is owed about $900 million in capital upgrades, and the agency as a whole is owed $32 billion in capital needs. Um, this is sort of just like a staggering um, disinvestment in our public housing stock. And in the face of this disinvestment, it's been really difficult to get the mayor or the governor to take the crisis seriously and to put the resources into NYCHA that the agency desperately needs. Um, so last year, Andrew Cuomo um, invested zero dollars in New York State's budget in NYCHA. Um, next year, they're investing over $1 billion in Amazon. So, you know, this is a sort of like political choice that we're seeing our governor making. Um, I want to talk about the rental affordability crisis. It sort of even seems silly to talk about because we're in New York City and we know that rent is really expensive. Um, but in this neighborhood in Queens, um, rent has gone up somewhere between 31% and 47% in the last five years. Um, 19 thousand households in this neighborhood in Queens don't have any renters rights at all. That means that when uh, their lease is up, their landlord can functionally do whatever they want. They can raise their rent um, right up to the market. Um, families can be displaced. Families can be evicted. 
Um, another 24,000 households in this neighborhood are rent stabilized. And rent stabilized tenants have been under attack by this city and the state for a long time. Right now, rent stabilization is a system of protections that are designed to protect renters in the event of a housing shortage. Um, they provide the right to a renewal lease at a limited rent increase annually. Um, next year, renters' rights are expiring in Albany, and while our governor is willing to give billions of dollars to Amazon, he has yet to commit to anything to address this rental housing crisis. So between these 24,000 rent-stabilized tenants whose sort of rights are on the chopping block, and these 19,000 um, renters that have no rights at all, and then these 600 or these 6,000 households that live in the biggest uh, public housing complex in, in the country, um, these are people in Queens that are not going to be, uh, that are not going to benefit at all from, from Amazon coming to this neighborhood. Um, so the last thing that I, that I really want to talk about, um, oh, so, sorry, one more thing about, um, about the renters' rights here. Since, um, since the Amazon deal was announced, um, there's already been an impact on the housing market. So tenants are already reporting um, a big increase in brokers coming to their apartments and offering them buyouts of their rent stabilized leases. Um, this is like an intentional uh, move by the real estate industry to profit off of the housing crisis, to profit off of Amazon while other folks are being displaced. Um, so that looks like that looks like evictions. That looks like forced displacement from your home, whether or not it actually happens in an eviction at all. Um, and so, what does that lead to? That leads to the biggest homelessness crisis that our state has seen in its history. Um, right now, eighty-nine thousand people don't have a place to live in New York State. Um, that is eighty. That's almost. Um, that's children who are homeless and whose education is being disrupted. It's people who don't have a place to sleep at night. This number is growing steadily, and if things don't change, it's expected to reach over 100,000 people by 2020. Um, and this number is underreported. Uh, it only really counts the people who are availing themselves of the shelter system. So this number doesn't count people that you would sort of understand or see as like street homeless. It counts people who are going and seeking a place in a shelter every night. Um, for every $100 increase in the monthly median rent, homelessness is expected to go up by 15%. So to put that in some context, in the last six years, rent has gone up somewhere between $500 and $700 a month in this neighborhood. Um, so that's a massive potential increase in homelessness that the city and the state really cannot afford. Um, so that just puts some context on the political choice to give $3 billion to the richest company in the world. Um, and sort of give some sort of background to who we're choosing not to assist um, when we choose to assist Amazon, which is really all I have to talk about. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Great, right, thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Josh Kellerman. Uh, Josh is the Director of Public Policy at the Retail, Wholesale, and Department Store Union, um, which organizes workers throughout the retail supply chain. Um, he's going to be talking about the impact of Amazon uh, on workers and what can be done to fight back. So please join me in welcoming Josh Kellerman. Hi, everybody. Thank you for uh, having me here. Um, as was mentioned, I work for a union here in New York City, and we represent retail workers. Not just retail workers at, say, Macy's and Bloomingdale's, which we do represent, but also workers in grocery stores and throughout the food supply chain. So you can get a sense of who our primary competition is right now. It's online retail. And online retail not only threatens to disrupt our membership, who have middle class jobs, they can support families on good schedules, benefits, and everything like that, um, but it also threatens our downtowns, right? The, the sort of downtown business districts that we have <laughs> that, you know, are sort of the vibrant cultural centers of our communities are often anchored by the retail life that exists there. These are the brick and mortar stores that invest in our, in our, in our space, in our physical infrastructure, 
and, uh, and create destinations and places for us to be. There's this tension right now where online retail is actually threatening that. And if we lose these downtown business districts, then what are, what are our downtowns? How do we come together as a society? These are really important questions we need to think through as we click each purchase online. Um, so uh, I want to focus on the workforce uh, because I think that there's sort of this, um, this uh, image that Amazon is actually a good <coughs> employer, right? They're bringing 25,000 high paying tech jobs in New York City and I want to challenge that. Um, first is that Amazon is first and foremost a logistics company. It's not a tech company, it's a logistics company. Up the vast majority of its workforce, 600,000 workers are in that logistics network, mainly warehousing workers, right? These are blue collar workers roughing it every day in a warehouse, often running, running essentially 15 miles a day in a warehouse, moving goods back and forth and putting them on trucks so they can land at your door. That is what Amazon does best. That is what Amazon does most. And that is where its primary labor violations and its problems occur. So when we talk about 25,000 jobs coming to New York City, that's a drop in the bucket for who Amazon is and what its workforce is. So when we think about a good job at Amazon, we actually don't, should not be picturing a tech worker in front of a computer. We should be picturing a warehouse worker toiling day in and day out. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, my union is opposed to giving any public subsidy to a company like this that is one of the wealthiest companies in the world. Particularly $3 billion is, is gross. Um, we're opposed to a low road employer coming to New York City and that we're funding them to come here. And by low road, I mean an employer that treats its employees like dirt. Um, and so on all, based on all of that, we released a report. Actually, my colleagues today and, and many of your colleagues today are at a city hall today at a press uh, conference where they're releasing this report called What's Wrong with Amazon? Um, and it really focuses on the labor questions. Of course, there's many other issues that uh, the company faces. but. Um, we're, we're right here in the middle of the fight. I mean, this is like ground zero for community groups fighting against the most powerful company in the world. And so I, I just want to encourage you all to like think about what your role is in that because it's an exciting moment. It's also a tough moment um, because of their power and because of how uh, the leadership of our city and our <coughs> state are aligned with this company. Um, and speaking to the question of the price of progress, um, I want to just like challenge that a little bit and say that the progress is never a one-way street. It's not an either or thing, it's always a street fight. And that's what we're right in the middle in to determine what does this progress look like. And if we don't actually, uh, you know, there's a saying that if, if, you're not, uh, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Um, and so this, this is an important thing to, to think about is what is our role? How are we going to shift this progress? Progress will happen. The question is whether we're at the table helping to make the, that decision. So. Um, the first thing I'll note is uh, Amazon is a deadly and dehumanizing place to work if you're in a warehouse. It's also dehumanizing if you're a tech worker. I don't know if you've heard the stories about people crying at their desks on a regular basis, uh, has the highest turnover of any, for or the second highest turnover of any Fortune 500 company. Um, but people are dying in the warehouses. Uh, a report from the National Council of Occupational Safety and Health named Amazon one of its dirty dozen companies describes, quote, a disturbing pattern of preventable deaths at Amazon facilities. Amazon workers suffer injuries and sometimes lose their lives in a work environment with a relentless demand to fill orders and close monitoring of employee actions. Over the last five years, seven workers have died at Amazon facilities. Two were crushed by forklifts in the warehouse. One was run over by a truck. One was killed at a, by a driver in its parking lot. One suffered a fatal heart attack event during an overnight shift. One was dragged and crushed by a conveyor belt, and one was killed and crushed by a pallet loader. Two more Amazon workers were killed just weeks ago uh, when a warehouse partially collapsed in Maryland. That's just the deaths. Ambulances parked outside of warehouses. A New York Times article recently stated in a Pennsylvania warehouse, quote, so many ambulances responded to medical assistance calls at the warehouse during a heat wave that the retailer paid an ambulance company to have paramedics and ambulances stationed outside the warehouse during several days of excess heat over the summer. About 15 people were taken to hospitals while 20 or 30 more were treated right there. So those are the deaths and injuries. Now let's talk about dignity. It's important to have a dignified workplace, to feel that you, uh, you actually are, um, have <coughs> dignity in your workplace. 
In the UK, it was reported that coworkers were peeing in bottles because they were worried about taking, that taking a bathroom break could result in being disciplined. A separate survey reportedly found that almost three quarters of UK fulfillment center staff members were afraid of using the toilet because of time concerns. Now let's talk about scheduling. How do you organize your life if you don't know when you're going to work? How do you schedule childcare if you're sent home from work early? You still have to pay for the childcare. How do you actually schedule your uh, education if, uh, if you never know when you're going to be working? Amazon has been utilizing unstable scheduling as one of its primary practices in its workplace. Um, it's become increasingly reliant on a work schedule scheme that often courses workers to leaving their shifts early or turns them away at the door without notice. So those are some of the worker issues that are faced by Amazon workers. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about anti-union activities. Um, so unions are, I think, a somewhat mis misunderstood uh, entity in the United States. Um, fundamentally, though, uh, we're protected, you know, our activities are protected by the First Amendment, which not only is the freedom of speech, right, which is what we hear about most often, uh, not only the freedom of religion, not only freedom of press, but freedom of association. Your ability to associate with who you want, when you want, based on any particular uh, purpose. This is enshrined in the First Amendment of our Constitution. Yet, we see union busting, and a union is essentially that, workers just coming together to demand better conditions in their workplace. We see union busting activities across the board, particularly at Amazon. They recently released a video, a company-wide training video called, quote-unquote, labor training. It's for Whole Foods, you know they bought Whole Foods, uh, and also for Amazon managers. Um, and in uh, one section, entitled Warning Signs, uh, it teaches managers how to look out for activities that can indicate uh, what they call associate disengagement, vulnerability to organizing or early organizing activity. They note the use of words like living wage and steward might indicate this. Associates raising concerns on behalf of their coworkers. <coughs> Workers, quote, who normally aren't connected to each other suddenly hanging out together. Increased negativity in the workplace or, quote, any other associate behavior that is out of character. So this is essentially a company that is now monitoring who you're talking with, when you're talking with them, what you're talking about, which is essentially undermining uh, what we think is, you know, our First Amendment right to freedom of association. Uh, this, thank you, this raised uh, so many concerns that Senator Sanders and Senator Warren sent a letter to Amazon raising their concerns about their, what they considered illegal activity uh, against unions. They have, Amazon has ramped up hiring of union busting managers. Uh, you can see it on their job listings. Uh, Bezos uh, owns the Washington Post, and there's been several labor, labor issues that they've run into there since he's owned the, uh, the newspaper. Um, it has shuttered uh, one unionizing facility. So rather than allowing it to unionize, it shuttered. Um, this is happening all around the world. Workers are striking in Spain, Italy, France, Germany, Poland, and England in their warehouses. Um, and they've been fighting unionization in Poland and the Czech Republic. One article described Australia, uh, their warehouses, as a hellscape. So, I mean, it, you know, anyways, I, I'm going to lay off of that for a second and at, in conclusion talk about a couple of other things. Um, one is the, the destruction of brick and mortar, uh, job, brick and mortar retailers and job loss at taxpayer expense. Job Job churn is a really important concept here. Amazon is not creating new jobs. What they're doing is as jobs are destroyed at brick and mortar retailers, they're shifting into warehouses. So there's one estimate that um, between 2004 and 2016, Amazon resulted in the net loss of 150,000 jobs nationwide. Yet, our subsidy program specifically incentivized the creation of new jobs by Amazon. So the 25,000 jobs and the $3 billion they're getting here is specifically for creating new jobs. Yet, when you look at the net jobs that are being lost, it's actually a net loss for the city. Um, and lastly, I'll note that Amazon's platform, its market, has been used as a platform to promote racist and white nationalist ideologies. Um, we did a, a study, released a study, uh, I shouldn't say we, a group of our community uh, partners called, uh, released a report called Delivering Hate. And it, um, it focused on, um, uh, that they basically were selling uh, racist, Islamophobic, and anti-Semitic 
uh, products on on the uh, on the platform. And while they said that they would, you know, block those third-party sellers that were doing it, uh, we've seen since then that uh, there there's no close monitoring of it. So essentially, Amazon is a platform for the sell for the sale of hateful ideologies. Um, and I'll just leave it at that because I think uh, it's again important to note that Amazon is not who you think they are, and we need to challenge them. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I think it's really important to uh, remember, of course, uh, as Josh reminded us, that Amazon is a logistics company. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about HQ2, uh, but not a whole lot of discussion about the warehouse fulfillment, uh, fulfillment center in Woodside, so it would be nice to bring those conversations together. Uh, okay, so our last speaker for this panel is Jake Streich uh, Kest, who is a campaign coordinator um, for the Alliance for a Greater New York. Um, an alliance of labor and community organizations united for a just and sustainable New York. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Jake Schreikkest. <laughs> All right, can you guys hear me? Yep. Cool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about tech jobs and also about like the impact on transit that HQ2 might have and then just more broadly about like what's been going on to stop this project and fight Amazon. Um, so first on tech jobs, like the big selling point, and we've all been talking about this, the big selling point of this project has been that it's going to bring 25,000, you know, good paying, high paying tech jobs uh, to New York City. But when you look at the tech industry in New York right now, you know, it's not, it's not really the people in this room who are going to be getting those jobs. So right now, only one in three tech workers in New York City were even born or, or rather live in New York State. And that's just in New York State, so it's probably even lower in New York City. So again, like two-thirds two of tech workers right now in New York aren't even from New York. 60% um, of tech workers in New York right now are white. 70% of tech workers in New York right now are male. Um, so, you know, when we talk about, you know, diversifying the economy to bring in, you know, tech jobs and not relying on Wall Street, we're not really diversifying who's actually, you know, receiving the benefits. It's still, you know, these jobs going to mostly white, white men who, you know, don't need these jobs and it's not going really to the communities who need these jobs. Um, and so, you know, Amazon, the city, has been talking about how, you know, people from Long Island City and people from Qu Queensbridge might have access to these jobs. But, you know, right now what they've been saying is they're going to put $5 million into a training fund. This is $5 million from, you know, a trillion dollar company. It's, it's nothing. It's a drop in the hat. It's not a serious commitment to actually you know, train low-income people of color to actually be able to get these $150,000, $200,000 paying jobs. You know, the other thing they've committed to is to holding job fairs in Queensbridge houses. You know, I'm not entirely sure what that means or how that leads to somebody getting a job, a tech job in Amazon. You know, they can advertise these jobs all they want all over the city. The bottom line is we know who they're recruiting. They're recruiting highly educated, you know, not from, not CUNY students, not people from the city, they're recruiting, you know, white men from outside the city to work in these jobs and, and get these benefits. Um, you know, the other thing I just want to talk about quickly is transit. It's so like, raise your hand if you've been late to work or to school just in the last week. <laughs> right, so like, we... <laughs> Right, so like the, M <laughs> you know, I don't have to go on and on about how bad the MTA is right now, but when we're talking about, you know, giving a $3 billion subsidy to Amazon, that's a choice to not invest money in the, in the MTA. You know, and what that choice means, again, is that, you know, low-income people, people who are working and going to school are often late to school and late to work and have to suffer the consequences of that. Um, I mean, the other thing is, adding 25,000 new people to Long Island City means a massive influx of riders on the 7 train, on the other trains that are already way too overcrowded. So if you imagine taking a rush hour train now and then adding thousands and thousands and thousands of people to it on trains that, you know, already are constantly shut down for signal problems, 
you know, it's just kind of a disaster waiting to happen in a system that's already a disaster. Um, so, you know, that's kind of some of the reasons why people are against this deal. I think what's been going on right now is there's kind of a wide coalition of groups that's been getting together and forming and saying, you know, not just no to the subsidies, but no to, this, no to Amazon at all. Because we're seeing that, you know, that New York City isn't, you know, right now prepared for this influx of people. You know, these type of tech jobs that they're bringing aren't the jobs we want. Amazon, with their you know, anti-union, anti-worker practices that Josh just talked about, isn't the type of company that we really want in New York City. So right now, people are saying you know, no to this deal. Um, and you know, what we've seen is that you know, this deal was made by <laughs> Amazon, Governor Cuomo, and Mayor de Blasio. You know, none of those people are, are immune to people organizing against them. We've seen, just recently, Amazon announced that they were raising their pay up their minimum pay up to $15 an hour. And you know, they didn't pull that number out of nowhere. That number is obviously a response to workers organizing across the country and demanding $15 an hour. So we've seen them you know, respond to demands and people organize and make them. Um, we've seen in Minnesota where, uh, I don't know, there was a New York Times article a week or two ago about how warehouse, Amazon warehouse workers in Minnesota have been organizing and getting them to make concessions in their warehouses there. So we've seen when people get together and organize, they can move Amazon. We've seen Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio react when people point out that what they're doing isn't exactly progressive. You know, I think we're seeing that, you know, they thought everyone was gonna be really happy with this deal, that, oh great, we're bringing 25,000 new jobs. And now they're kind of realizing that, you know, this isn't, people don't see this as a good progressive thing and they're, they're kind of worried and they're kind of scared. Um, so yeah, people have been taking action against Amazon. I don't know if people saw on the news on Monday, it was Cyber Monday. Um, you know, there were hundreds of people, there were a hundred people that went and shut down the Amazon store, a bookstore in Midtown Manhattan. Um, later that day, there were a couple hundred people who were out in the rain in Long Island City um, who marched to assembly member Kathy Nolan's office. She's the, she's the assembly member who represents this district and she's basically besides de Blasio and Cuomo, the only elected official who represents this area who supports the deal. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of work to do to kind of move the assembly members and get de Blasio and Cuomo on the right path. But, you know, it's not impossible. There are ways in Albany to stop these subsidies from happening. Um, and there's kind of a wide coalition of different groups. Most of the groups represented at this table right now are a part of it. Um, so yeah, the fight, there's all these reasons why Amazon shouldn't come, but that it's not quite inevitable yet. There's a lot of groups fighting this. There's a lot of ways to stop it. Um, and you know, I'm happy to talk more after this if people want to know ways of getting involved. I know there's uh, a rally on Friday of CUNY students um, who are meeting at 100 Wall Street um, to kind of say, you know, again, like investing three billion in Amazon is a choice rather than investing three billion in CUNY. Um, so I can give people more info on that. You know, there's going to be actions in Albany and in New York City over the coming months. Um, so this isn't a done deal yet. There's still a lot to be done to stop it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. So uh, we have uh, a little bit of time left for questions um, and comments. Uh, we have two microphones here. Uh, at the, at the foot of the stairs, so um, any questions, please line up. I think about 10 minutes or so. Hi, um, my name is Honor Mosier. Um, I'm an activist and organizer here in Queens. Um, you say this isn't a done deal yet. Can you be more specific and do you have a sense of a timeline? Um, and are, do you have any understanding of anyone organizing to take any of this to court to slow that timeline down? I guess we don't get to you, but we can start. Oh, uh, okay, we could do that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll take two at a time. Hello, uh, this, my name is Miko. This question is more for the organizers. Um, I'm curious about, uh, what we can learn from the past from victories such as rent stabilization and public housing 
that not every city has that in this, this country. It's a pretty big deal that we were able to even win that. How can we, in our modern circumstances, not just you know, stop Amazon, but win more concessions, like have more housing, uh, have better transit? Um, and also, is it possible to uh, do what other countries do and uh, break down monopolies and nationalize them? Because, I mean, the, the biggest problem with Amazon is that it's a, it's a private corporation. There's, like, no democratic control over it. I mean, they're anti-union because they don't want the workers to have a say in how it's ran. So how can we uh, do that here? <coughs> Great. Thanks. Should we start with those two questions, then? Sure. Organizers? Sure. Does this, this mic works. Yeah. Um, so I say it's not a done deal. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy to stop it. It's going to be a hard, hard fight. Um, but, you know, there are, right now, the way they're getting subsidies is through, you know, different laws that have been passed in Albany. So, you know, right now, there's efforts to pressure, you know, assembly members and state senators to try to figure out what we can do to pass laws to change how those subsidies get doled out to try to take away that subsidy money. You know, there's also something called the Public Authorities Control Board um, that we think has control over that $500 million straight cash grant that Amazon is getting, um, and we think there's a chance that we can, you know, get that control board to vote to, to stop that $500 million cash grant. Do you want to talk? Yeah, I can add, add some more detail there. Um, so the big thing to know is that, you know, we have this whole land use process in New York City called ULERP, the Univer Uniform Land Use Review Process, and that's where community boards and borough presidents and city council all get involved in having a say in the project. Cuomo has proposed doing something that essentially undermines the Euler process. It's called the general project plan. And the state can come in, essentially anywhere in the, in the state, the state can come in to a locality and say, your land use process is not valid because this is a state-led project. So we're going to run it according to our own rules. So what's going to happen in New York City is they're going to try to bypass ULERP and use this general project plan. It's how they did Atlantic Yards, if you all remember the Barclays Center and that whole fight. Um, that was done under a general project plan, and it's why community lacked the leverage that they typically have on this project. Um, so there's one moment <coughs> coming up soon around the general project plan. It, the general project plan also has to be approved by the Public Authorities Control Board. The Public Authorities Control Board is a state board. It has appointees from, uh, at this point, it has, you know, uh, it's Republican-led uh, because we're, we still haven't sh switched over to uh, the new, um, uh, in January, right, we'll have a majority Senate Democrats, but uh, currently there's a Republican person on it uh, and, and, and one Democrat on it, and then Cuomo's appointee. So it's a three-person board, and they have to unanimously approve these projects to go through. So we're focusing on the PACB as, as one area where potentially we could stymie some of this. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, then uh, also the subsidies have to be approved by the PACB, and they're talking, Cuomo's talking about ways around that as well uh, through other budget maneuvers. Um, and, then, and then, you know, assuming that we lose at the PACB, the general project plan will go forward, there will still need to be an environmental quality review process where there'll be scoping hearings, there'll be numerous hearings around that. Then there will still be some uh, community-based hearings around the project itself. Um, and so none of these are sort of silver bullets. They are opportunities for us to have a strong voice. Again, not to we may not necessarily stop the project, although you know, that's the goal of many of the groups in the coalition, but what we can do is again, shape progress, right? Mm -hmm. Dictate how, help to dictate how the benefits of this project actually go back to the community and not just up to Jeff Bezos. And I'll just add the PACB next meeting is December 19th, and so there's already plans for you know, lots of folks to go to Albany and demand that they vote down this project. It's unclear whether they'll vote on it on December True. 19th. <coughs> uh, so we're trying to delay it beyond the December 19th vote so we get the new Senate majority appointee in and can hopefully influence that process more. Yeah, and I can speak to the third question about public housing and rent stabilization, um, not as much to the antitrust monopoly question, um, although I think it's a good idea. Um, 
I think that the sort of key strategy here that applies to Amazon and it applies to all land use processes, rent processes in, in New York City and New York State is that there's a really critical need to break up this sort of unholy alliance between the real estate industry and our elected officials at every level of government. Um, so the way that we do that is by organizing a strong tenants movement um, in every part of the state and in every part of the city and both holding elected officials accountable but also refusing, also taking fights directly to the corporations that are profiting from a system that, um, that starves public agencies and displaces renters. Um, it's clear that um, that right now Albany is, sort of, is working directly for landlords really and I think that's kind of clear in this Amazon deal as well. Um, it's just another example of a massive corporate giveaway from Andrew Cuomo's office to some of the richest, most powerful companies in the world. And so organizing people directly against both Amazon and the sort of political structure that holds them up is I think a way to push this forward. Um, and it's how we won rent control for the first time in you know 1917 was by organizing tenants um, both into rent strikes against their landlords and for more rights out in Albany. Um, so I think it's how we're going to win again next year. And, and uh, very briefly about about this question about how to how to regulate Amazon. Um, I mean I think that's a it's that's a, a really important question. Um, you know unfortunately I mean there have been have been calls to break it up. Um, to uh, treat it like a utility, um, imposing some common carrier obligations on Amazon, kind of like the net neutrality laws. Um, or, uh, but you know, the problem is, that I, uh, my understanding is that you know, the courts generally since the 1980s have sort of rewritten the, the, the laws on, on um, regulating trusts and monopolies, um, essentially looking at it from the consumer perspective um, as opposed to from the perspective of producers. Uh, which means that if, uh, if you know, Amazon is sort of deemed to be uh, the most efficient way of delivering goods and services to consumers, then it's not violating any uh, antitrust <coughs> regulations. And so I think that that sort of has to be, perspective has to change, it has to go back to looking at the economic power of producers, um, as well as, uh, you know, how, however sort of um, important um, consumer boycott movements are, and I'm not disparaging them, I think that sort of puts the onus on consumers where the onus should really be on the produ producers, uh, if anything. And we have to change, I think, that, that sort of discussion um, to look at the, 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 the power of, of companies like Amazon, particularly in this sort of, in this age of, of these platform giants. Uh, do we have time for one more, two more questions or so? Hi. Um, thank you all for your time and your information. It was really informative. So my name is Miguelina Rodriguez. I'm a professor here of urban sociology. I also work at the LaGuardia Wagner Archives. My question is for Josh, and it's more for our students. The way I teach, I try to give students practical tools or decisions they can make, because sometimes these conversations can make people feel helpless. It's this big monster, right, Goliath that we're up against. And my question to you is, if you can give us some companies that we can shop at and give our money to that are more um, ethical than Amazon, because Amazon is such a giant that sometimes it does make it, it seem like it's impossible to shop anywhere else. So are there any companies or websites <laughs> that you can give our students so that if, when they shop, because they all shop, uh, they feel that at least they're not contributing to this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll take one more question, then we'll, we'll answer them together. Hi, my question has to do with sort of the, the business model and the long-term, you know, plans. The Cuomo keeps talking about how great this will be 30 years from now, but I'm always wondering if it's a business based on consumerism and buying things, how, how, how will that still be happening? Will we still be doing the same thing 30 years from now when they're saying how great this is and you know, investing in this infrastructure? Maybe that's a question for the sociology teacher. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, retail unions don't have a lot of density uh, in this city or in this or in the country. Um, the reason is because retail is a hard job. It's an in, largely an entry level job uh, where there's a lot of turnover. So it's very difficult to unionize in the retail sector. However, uh, a few of them are that are unionized. Good jobs. Uh, Macy's, Bloomingdale's. Uh, those are uh, H&M and Zara. Um, those are four companies that are currently under union contracts where the workers have a say in their workplace. Uh, there's uh, health and safety committees on the shop floor. 
uh, to ensure that workers are, you know, have safe working conditions and um, they have benefits and they can support their families on those jobs. Um, you wouldn't believe it, but Dwayne Reed is under contract. Um, so all of those pharmacies around the city uh, that are Dwayne Reed, not Walgreens, not CVS, Dwayne Reed is union. Um, and, uh, and then as far as grocery stores, Fairway, Gristides, ShopRite, uh, Stop and Shop, uh, those are uh, some of the, uh, the union um, grocery stores in the city. Um, so uh, yeah, I encourage you all to shop there. And, and at, when, you, when you're shopping there, ask the workers about it. Ask them what they think about the union. What do they think about being in a workplace where, uh, where they have a voice? You know, you get a lot of different, uh, you know, opinions on it, but that's part of the interest in, in hearing what workers have to say. Um, and then compare that to going into a workplace where there's no union and workers will be afraid to even speak to you. Oh, uh, I'm just thinking 30 years from now, wow. I don't know if anyone knows, yesterday uh, we went to Mars and they cloned a human being, so I just wonder, 30 years, I'm wondering if all of the Amazon fulfillment centers will all be robots. And uh, I, I don't know, and, and getting back to this consumption as a way of life, I kind of side with Philip over here that the onus shouldn't be on us as consumers, but on the structural conditions that promote this, this system of consumption. I don't think it's, you know, <coughs> shopping ethically and consciously. I, I think you've got to, these are bigger structural issues, and it's not up to the only shouldn't be on an individual to make a so-called ethical choice. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for attending, and the panelists, for a really interesting, informative discussion. And please, um, you're welcome to stay for uh, two more panels that are coming up. The next one starts at 11.45. Thanks, everybody. I have a card that I'll get for you. Okay. You know, yeah.